This is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. Good morning. Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States, and that means change across the board in the United States government. Here to talk about what kinds of changes we can expect, Dr. Mark Jones, fellow in political science at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University, and Dr. Brandon Roddinghouse, political science professor at the University of Houston. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Peaceful transition of power. We've heard that a lot. Um, this is certainly a peaceful transition, but it also seems like this one is a little bit more interesting than previous transitions. What's your take on what's going to be happening here? Well, it's Donald Trump, so we're in a brave new world, but you really have a contrast between two presidents in terms of Barack Obama, more serious, uh, focused on policy. Trump more braggadocious, much more conservative policy. And so it's been a rockier transition. And certainly we haven't seen the level of cooperation that we saw uh, in 2008, 2009, when George W. Bush and uh, President Obama really engaged in a very cooperative, productive transition where they really worked as a team to sort of steer the country through the crisis that was facing at the time. President Obama, on the surface, the optics were, we want this president to succeed, and it was very, at least the way it looked, they were being very cooperative. Yeah. What's the difference this time around? I think the difference is just like Mark said, that there's a lot more friction between the, the two parties. Uh, polarization is higher than it was. I think, you know, personally, there's a lot more conflict. Um, there's a great story about the transition from Jimmy Carter to President Reagan. Uh, and the Carter team had produced these giant binders of information and spent weeks and weeks preparing these. And they literally left the White House with them all because the Reagan team didn't want to see them. <laughs> there's a thing about transition to power that makes it awkward because once politics get involved, things begin to spin out of control. And we've seen this reflected, I think, too, in the numbers for Trump, right? His numbers in terms of uh, current approval are lower than we've seen since Jimmy Carter was transitioned to president. So this is something I think reflects that politics, which which messes everything up. Well, some of the optics, too, uh, and I know in, in 2008, after the inauguration, Republicans got together and said, we want to make this president a one-term president. Mm -hmm. There was that optic. And then this time around, with President Obama saying we want this, this president to succeed, remembering that in 2008, Donald Trump at that time was leading the birther movement right. to make uh, President Obama seem illegitimate in terms of a president. And now we have this particular uh, president coming in with protest and in fact some of people like Democrats Al Green yeah. saying that he was not going to attend the inauguration and this is why he said he wouldn't do it. I cannot participate in the inauguration of a person who calls women dogs, who would bar Muslims from this country, who has insulted a gold star family, who has insulted Latinos, who has made it very comfortable for people who promote bigotry and hate to be comfortable with his rhetoric and his campaign. So in that kind of environment, how likely is that to impact this administration as it tries to get going? Or is that something that can be expected? Well, it, it makes it a little more difficult. I mean, for instance, having about over 60 members of Congress say they're not going to attend your inauguration, that's significant. That hasn't happened in the past to this degree. Uh, it's going to make it more, more difficult for Trump because in the past, presidents after their election have tried to broaden their support, reached out to people across the aisle. And you've seen that in popularity and approval ratings that have risen. Trump hasn't really done that. And so he's starting off with a weaker base of support. As Brandon mentioned, it's low approval ratings. And unless he can get those to go up, it's going to be harder for him to push through his agenda, especially after he gets out of the honeymoon period. Most of the time when a new president comes in, he can count on the base of his own party. In this case, Maybe, uh, certainly a lot of uh, Republicans have said, okay, we have a new president, we can do this. But th people sometimes forget that before he won, he didn't have a whole lot of support from his own party. Yeah, I think you were both right. You definitely have a honeymoon period for presidents. The problem is that honeymoons require you to be nice and play <laughs> well with others. And if you're not doing that, then it's going to create a serious amount of friction. I think. It's going to be a political problem for the president that you've got these people who are boycotting some of the festivities. There's a symbolic, I think, role that that plays. But I think there's also a substantive impact where if you can't hit the ground running, even if you hit the ground with a kind of brisk stride, you're still not getting the momentum you need for the first 100 days, which is a critical sort of phase for presidents to be able to kind of set the tone for what's going to happen. Our recent opinion polls have showed that Mr. Trump with a fairly large disapproval rating of about 50 percent, George W. Bush was near 25 percent, President Obama 
near 14 percent disapproval, to which President Trump responded via Twitter. Uh, the same people who did the phony election polls and were so <laughs> wrong are now doing approval rating polls. They are rigged just like before. Does he have a point? Uh, I mean, he has a point in the sense that the polls did have some errors, particularly at the state level. But let's keep in mind, they were off by two or three or four points. They weren't off by 10 points. Also, they were trying to measure people who were going to turn out to vote. And that's tricky to actually predict who's going to vote. These approval ratings are measuring all registered voters or all Americans. And so you know, maybe they're missing it by three or four, four points. But all the same, uh, Trump is still entering as the pr president with the lowest approval ratings in the modern era. It's a reminder of the kind of relationship that this president is likely to have with the media and the public, <laughs> is it not? Yeah. We saw lots of fireworks in his first press conference as president-elect, and I think we're going to see much the same. And this is not, frankly, good for him. I mean, the fact that they're not able to really kind of control the message is going to hamper their ability to communicate with the American people. He has his core supporters, and I think, you know, like Mark said, there are people he cares about who are going to go vote or not go vote. But there is, I think, still a need for him to be able to talk to the American people broadly because he needs that persuasion to be successfully transitioned to legislative process, but he also needs there to be some representation. Well, he says that tweeting gives him a chance to go ahead and make that communication. He's the first tweeting president we've had. Yeah. And so this is going to be a chance for him to do that and maybe bypass the media. Smart move? Yeah. Well, I think it's smart if it's the case that you only want to care about the people you're talking to. That's an electoral move, right? That's a partisan move. If he wants to have a broader representative sort of sense of how the presidency functions, then he can't just talk to people on Twitter. Uh, this is very important to me as a journalist. I believe the importance of free press and interacting with the uh, president. I think it's uh, important to be able to do that. Um, the president uh, had a chance to talk about that as well. In his final news conference, President Obama said one of the things that is essential to the democracy is a free press. Listen. That is part of how this place, this country, this grand experiment in self-government has to work. Uh, it doesn't work if we don't have a well-informed citizenry. And you are the conduit through which they receive uh, the information about what's taking place in the halls of power. So America needs you and our democracy needs you. We need you to establish a baseline of facts and evidence that we can use as a starting point for the kind of reasoned and informed debates that ultimately lead to progress. Now, some people think that it may have been a way for him to signal to President Trump that it's not such a bad thing if the media is pushing back against you. You right. think that that was part of the intention and you think it might work or not? Uh, I doubt it's going to work. I mean, Donald Trump is America's really first populist president of sort of the modern era of communications. We do have experience with populists elsewhere in the world, and we see that they have much more conflict with the media and tend to use carrots and sticks with the media to a much greater extent than uh, presidents who are non-populist, like President Obama or President Bush. And so we are likely to see uh, President Trump uh, essentially evict certain media outlets or not respond to them or not allow them access uh, as ways of reprisals if he doesn't like the way they're reporting. And that's a it does get a little dangerous in terms of for the media because they have to sort of balance between access and then reporting the truth. You know, as I, as I watch all of this transition, I know that the, the Electoral College was clear who, who the winner was, but I also know that the popular vote was uh, in favor of Mrs. Clinton. And so I'm wondering, why do you think it is that uh, maybe the winners just say to the victor go the spoils and everybody else, you just have to play along and that's the way it's going to go. Um, he kind of said this is the way it's going to be. This is the highway. It's going to be our philosophy. And the cabinet picks that he has have no Hispanics in it, which is, yeah. if we talk about populists, but that's not putting in a pretty big part of the population. Yeah. I mean, he's using his institutional leverage, as all presidents do, but he's using it in such a way that uh, doesn't necessarily reflect that kind of American ideal, which is to try to be inclusive. And all presidents have tried this, even Republican presidents. So this is a very new sort of phenomenon, and I think it's going to be problematic for him. I mean, part of the problem is that there's a kind of representative function in the presidency, and that it's supposed to be a representative of all people, at least as it's sort of currently incarnated. Uh, but there's also a political problem for him, too. I mean, if he's not able to really reach out to these groups and he continues to alienate these groups that were moving against him in the, the election, I think it's problematic for him going forward. So this is something that he could remedy, and I think they're going to have to think carefully about how to do that. No, 